Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to explain to you what your genetic test report means. I'm going to go step by step through your report and hopefully make it look a little bit less like Chinese. I'm a genetic counselor and I specialize in hereditary cancer. So interpreting and explaining genetic test reports is literally what I do all day. You may have had genetic testing because of a personal or family history of cancer, and the degree to which your genetic test report was explained to you probably differs depending on who exactly ordered the test for you. So the goal of this video is to help you understand a little bit more about all the details of your genetic test report. So I'm going to use sample test reports that are available online from the different labs, and you may have been tested through one of these labs. So your report might look exactly like one of the ones that I'm going to show you, but if, even if you were tested through another lab, the report is probably very similar in terms of format. So grab a copy of your test report and follow along as I go step by step and demystify what your genetic test report means. And let me know in the comments below, if you've had genetic testing, have you actually met with somebody who went over your test report? I'm curious to know. So let's get started. I'm not going to go through every single teeny tiny part of the test report. I'm just going to highlight the most important part so that you have a good understanding of what it means in general. Okay, so the first thing you're going to see at the top of the report is basic demographic information. So you'll see your name, your date of birth, who ordered the genetic testing, what the date of the sample collection was, and when the test was reported. The other thing you'll see at the top of the report is the name of the specific panel of genes through which you were tested. So different labs will have different names for all of the different panels of genes that you could be tested through. For example, a lab called Myriad has a panel of genes called MyRisk. A different lab called Invite has a panel of genes called MultiCancer Panel. Now, many different labs have many, many different panels of genes that you could be tested through. And there's usually a lot of overlap between the genes that are offered at the different labs. So although the names of the panels are different, that might include the exact same genes. And another thing to mention here, there's a common misconception that there is only one genetic test or we're only looking at one gene. But really, genetic testing is very customizable. So we know that there's many different genes that have some sort of association with cancer risk. So your doctor can pick and choose which genes are relevant to test for in yourself based on your personal and family history of cancer. So it's not like you had the genetic test. There's many different possible genetic tests for cancer. Now, let's get into the actual test results. There's three possible scenarios. Your test results can be entirely negative, they can be positive, or something in between. If the genetic test results were normal, it will say at the top, no mutations were identified or no mutations were detected. And that means that your personal or family history of cancer basically remains unexplained. And there's a few possible explanations for a negative test result. It could be that your family history of cancer is not hereditary, or it could be that your testing was negative, but there is a genetic mutation in your family, which you were lucky enough not to inherit, and that could only be detected by testing other family members. Or it could mean that all the cancer in the family is due to a mutation in a gene that is not currently known. So genetic testing is not a one and done deal. If your testing was negative today, we may recommend some more updated testing in a few years from now while we'll know more about genetics and cancer. It's also possible, although a lot less likely, that there is a mutation in one of the genes that were tested, but the current technology cannot detect it. Now, if there were any genetic variants that were found, you will see that listed at the top. First, you'll see the name of the gene in which a variant was found. Then, you'll see the name of the specific variant that you have. And this will usually be a combination of letters and numbers. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here because this is really beyond the scope of this video, but I will give you some examples. So what you'll see here is that there were two variants found, one in a gene called BRCA2 and the other one in a gene called PALB2. So if we look first at the variant in BRCA2, you'll see that there's a letter C dot and then four numbers, 4638 and then there's a del. So that means that at a specific position within the BRCA2 gene, there is a deletion. So that is one type of genetic alteration. Whereas in the PALB2 gene, you'll see a different type of alteration. You'll see that at position 2,482, instead of a T, there is a C. So it's kind of like a spelling mistake in the genetic code. And then next to those two variants, you'll see in brackets some different letters and numbers. So genetics is already confusing, but then there's another layer of confusion because the exact same variant can be written in different ways. 
But the bottom line is, any variant that is found, the report will list the genes that have the variants, and then they will list the specific variant within those genes. And this is really what's important for you to share with your family. Because for example, if you have a mutation, then your siblings each have a 50% chance of having that same mutation. So you can share a copy of your test report with them and then they can take it to their doctor for testing. And their doctor will know which specific mutation needs to be looked at based on your test report. Now, while we're on this sample test report, look at the last column where it says variant classification. And you'll see that the BRCA2 variant is classified as pathogenic whereas the PALV2 variant is classified as uncertain significance. Basically, anytime the lab identifies a variant in one of the genes that are being analyzed, the lab must determine whether that variant is disease-causing or pathogenic, or it's just a harmless, benign genetic alteration. We all carry a lot of variation in our DNA, and most of it doesn't cause any problems. It's only when it destroys the function of the gene, then we may be at higher risk for cancer. So every time a lab encounters a genetic variant, meaning something that is different from what we normally expect in the genetic code, they have to classify it into one of five classes. So I'm going to start from the bottom here. So class one and class two are benign and likely benign. And you wouldn't even know that you carry these variants because the lab will not report them. It will, it will just say that you have a, a negative genetic test report. We know that benign and likely benign variants don't impact the function of the gene. So now let's go to the top where we see pathogenic or likely pathogenic, meaning these are disease-causing genetic alterations, also known as mutations, and that's considered a positive result, meaning a genetic change was found in a specific gene, and there's enough evidence to say that that specific genetic change destroys the function of the gene and leads to an increased risk of cancer. Now, in between a positive and a negative result, we have what we call variants of uncertain significance. So like I said, variation is very common in humans, so variants of uncertain significance are very common. In fact, the more genes we test, the higher the chance of finding these variants of uncertain significance. Now over time, as more people around the world are getting tested, we will, be, we will learn more and more about what all the different human variation means. So over time, the number of variants of uncertain significance will decrease. So as time goes on, these variants of uncertain significance are getting reclassified, either downwards to benign or likely benign, or upwards to pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Most of the time, variants of uncertain significance are downgraded. So we are not supposed to typically act on a variant of uncertain significance. We're not supposed to use that to impact your medical management but we keep our eye on it. So if in the future the lab has more data and they say that this is likely to be clinically significant, you know, pathogenic or likely pathogenic, then we may act on it like a positive result. So anytime the lab reclassifies a variant either upward or downward, they send an amended report to the doctor that ordered your genetic test report. So you can check in with your doctor you know, every couple of months or every year and see if there have been any changes to the classification of your variants. Another thing I'll mention here is that typically if you have a variant of uncertain significance, it's not recommended that other people in your family should be tested for it because, you know, if we don't know what it means in you, we're not going to know what it means in your relative either. Sometimes it could be useful to test other family members. Let's say there's a variant of uncertain significance in a gene that is associated with ovarian cancer. And there's three people in the family that have ovarian cancer and many who don't. Now, if we test all the people in the family who had ovarian cancer, and they're all found to have that same variant of uncertain significance in that ovarian cancer gene, and we test all the people that didn't have ovarian cancer and none of them have that variant, then we say that the variant is segregating with disease. So sometimes it can be helpful to test certain family members to help in the eventual reclassification of the variants. Now, something else that you'll see on all genetic test reports is a list of all of the genes for which you were tested. So, for example, on Myriad's test report, that is on the first page usually, sometimes on the second page. So, it looks like they were tested for about 30 genes. On Invite's report, you will see that a few pages down. Let's see. Okay, so you see a list of all of the genes that were included there. So, that's useful for you to know if a doctor ever asks you what genes were you tested for, you have that in your report. And if you're ever going for updated testing, you know which genes you were already tested for. And by the way, here I'm going to mention that 
more genes is not always necessarily better. You might be tested through an 83 gene panel, but if your family history is only concerning for breast cancer, you're basically being over-tested. The more genes tested, like I said before, the higher the chance of finding uncertain variants, which can just lead to anxiety and confusion. It may actually be more useful to test through a breast cancer specific panel and include extra genes that have been newly discovered to be associated with breast cancer and that maybe could explain the breast cancers in your family. Testing through an 83 gene panel will include genes associated with all types of cancers which may be irrelevant to your family. So sometimes these really big panels of genes are indicated and can be really helpful but sometimes more targeted testing is actually better for the family. So speak to your own doctors, your own genetic counselors about what is best for your family, but it's not one size fits all. Now, the other thing you're going to see on most genetic test reports is an explanation of the specific variant that was found in your testing. So here I'm, I'm looking at a test report from a lab called Ambry, and it looks like there's a variant of uncertain significance in a gene called CHECK2. So if we look down a little further in the report, we'll find an explanation of that specific variant. Okay, there's always a section on the test report which goes into the technical details of the genetic testing and the specific technology that they use. I'm not going to cover that in this video, but I did want to show you all the variant details that are included in this report. So if you look at that first paragraph there, they basically explain why the variant is being classified as being of uncertain significance. For example, if it's been reported before in many different families that have a strong family history of cancer, then a specific variant may be more likely to be classified as pathogenic or disease causing. Whereas if it's a variant that is very common in the general population and doesn't seem to predispose families to cancer, then it's more likely to be benign or likely benign, although that wouldn't be on the report. But sometimes the data is confusing and there's some evidence that points more towards pathogenicity and other evidence that points more towards the possibility that it's benign, so it's right in the middle. So then that will be included on your report. And if this is all starting to sound a little bit like Chinese, I'm going to go to the end of the report where they usually have nice information in patient-friendly language. So most reports have that. Okay, all of this is very technical stuff. I'm not going to go through that, but this is what I wanted to show you. So most labs have this information, um, whether you test positive, negative, or you have a variant of uncertain significance. So. For example, they tell you what type of result you have. So they explain briefly what a VUS is. They tell you about the fact that it might be reclassified in the future. They talk about what it means for your cancer risk, whether this should impact your risk management, talk about what, whether any family member should have testing. So this is really the most useful part of your genetic test report for you to understand what it means. So in terms of what's most important for your doctor, that is what's found all the way at the top of the report which is the specific gene that's affected and the specific variant that you have. But what's most important to patients is usually at the back of the report, a clear explanation of what your test results mean. And also, for example, in this lab, color, um, for a patient that tests negative, they'll include some information about the cancer risk in the general population. And they'll talk about ways to reduce your risk. You know, they'll talk about different screening guidelines for people in the general population. So that's really nice to read and you can get a lot of information from that. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that helped to clarify what your test report means. As usual, I'm going to link in the description box below to the National Society of Genetic Counselors website, where you can find a genetic counselor to help interpret your specific report and what it means specifically for you and for your family. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and please subscribe if you're interested in seeing more videos like this. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you don't miss any of the videos that I post every Friday. Thank you again for watching and see you next week. Bye!